Welcome to the 100th Monkey Radio with Tom, Jake, and Greg today. We have uh, Jake and Greg who are, uh, Jake's my nephew, and uh, Greg's a good friend of ours that uh, we are bringing into this conversation today because there has been a tremendous interest in this topic between the three of us uh, that uh, uh, we just felt that it definitely would be an added thing to have all three of us here during this discussion. And, uh, you know, guys, this is one, this is one topic that, you know, I, I, and, and I've heard this said on several other interviews on this topic. I never thought in my wildest dreams that I would even look at this topic and, and even, uh, even, I don't know, even consider it in the slightest way. Uh, but the evidence and the clues that have been put out there have, have made me take a step back. And, you know, I like to think that I have an open mind and I, I try to keep it open enough that my brains don't fall out and I'm able to let things in that uh, may shed some light on some of the some of the things that we're experiencing on this planet in this experience here on planet Earth. So. We've got uh, we've got Mark Sargent with us tonight, and he's been uh, he's been really uh, actually shaking up the airwaves here in the last couple of months with uh, some videos that he did on YouTube, the uh, Flat Earth Clues videos. And uh, guys, there's definitely links below on the show page that uh, you guys can can click on. It'll take you right to his video page, his YouTube video page, and I would definitely urge all of you. Uh, and, and it may be a good idea before you listen to the rest of this interview, if you just stop the audio right now and click on that link and watch the clues 1 through 11, and then come back and listen to our conversation, and then you'll be able to get a lot more out of what we're going to be talking about this, this afternoon than, than uh, if you had. So, so anyways, there you have it, and uh, uh, welcome to the 100th Monkey Radio, Mark. Hey, Tom. Thanks for having me. Man, uh, you know, I kind of like, uh, you know, our our subject matter here on the Hundreds Monkey is is uh, primarily we we focus in on the consciousness and spiritual spirituality aspects of of what's going on here, and you know, it's the basic raising of the the baseline of consciousness on the planet, and and uh, you know, uh, that hundred the monkey effect is that is that point that the collective consciousness reaches that critical mass. And that that uh, fact or that truth that was at one point ridiculous to to everybody, all of a sudden becomes one of those uh, those uh, automatic truths that oh everybody knows that type of idea. So so going from that basis, you know, and I think truth is the only thing that actually can trigger that hundredth monkey effect. Real truth. Uh, and this topic, the the flat Earth, I, oh man, <laughs> oh, what can you say? I mean, I mean, our whole lives from day one, that that you know, we have that globe in the classroom, you know, that that that's you know one of the first things you see when you're going to kindergarten is they've always got the globe sitting right there on the teacher's desk, and and it's it's an automatic assumption that we always continually make about the environment that we live in. Um, I mean, I don't know. I know there's a word for that. Um, uh, Programming. We don't nope. even take a second thought to, uh, to, to, to even question it. You know, our minds don't even journey there. I've, I've never once thought of flat earth. Like, yeah, like in history books, you, you hear about, you know, the past history, people used to think the earth was flat and they were crazy, you know, but never, never once would I actually contemplate this thought until I got on YouTube and looked at a couple of videos. And now everything is in question. I mean, from, from ground zero, I mean, if, if, if you can rock somebody's foundation, everything built on top of that is, is what? Who, who knows? Right. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. so what got you interested in this, Mark? Um, flat out boredom. <laughs> it was it was you know being you know going into the conspiracy stuff you know I, I looked at I looked at everything and literally this was the last book on the shelf 
and I had refused to read it for so long because, again, like you guys were saying, it's ridiculous, it's it's ludicrous, there's it's madness. There's there's no way because we were raised with it. There's no way, you know. You everybody knows what the truth is. The truth is a globe has to be, absolutely has to be. But when I started digging into it, I couldn't exactly tell why I thought it was the truth. Uh, you know, it was the same thing that everybody else says. You know, it's like, how do you know it's a globe? And you know, well, we just know. But how do you really know? Exactly. And that's when I started digging. So, yeah. I've flown, you know, I've made well over 50 um, airplane rides or whatever, right? <clears throat> but, yeah. and since hearing, since hearing about this, I've thought about, you know, and really, really try to uh, uh, remember looking at the windows. You know, and every version that I have and every flight I've taken, you know, looking at the windows, even still, just, you know, you would think being that high in the air, you would, you, there would be a, a no mistakable curve or, or something, but it just seems like it just goes on forever in all directions, no matter yeah. which way you look, no matter how high you fly. Yeah. But even back then, not even a question, didn't even, not even a second thought. No, no. If you if you would have asked me a year ago, uh, I would have I would have laughed at you. Absolutely, would have laughed you out of the room. And and this is coming from a guy. You know, who, who went to comic book conventions and, you know, seriously thought about driving out to Area 51 and having his picture taken by the sign and, and all that stuff. And, uh, and, and, and still, again, and that kind of gives you a scope of how big it really is. It's, it's so buried that even the conspiracy guys won't touch it. And then for whatever reason, this year, uh, there's just way, there's just so much activity re revolving around it. And when I was looking at it, you know, uh, a lot of the flat earth stuff that was out there, it was, it was, there was some good stuff, but it seemed to, for, to me, it was coming in like a staticky radio station. Right. And I, you know, I sat on it for a while and then I was like, you know, and you know what, if, if somebody gives this thing some structure, I think, you know, I could clear up the, you know, the station and, uh, and, and really, you know, do something here. And I, I had no idea it was going to get the response it did. You know, the, the videos you're looking at, they're not even six weeks old. And, right. uh, it's it's just been and the response that the other thing is the response has been so positive you know you'd think after i put my my phone number out there that i would get crank calls in the middle of the night you know from drunk people you know just you know ah you're nuts you know and hang that, up that, you are pretty nuts that's pretty brave to throw yeah. that out there like that <laughs> i don't know if it was brave as, as as much i did it to um stop the immediate label of shill which which seems to be thrown out there so oh, right. much and you know it's like okay look here's my here's my name here's my email address here's my um my phone number and then by the time i got to number 10 i put my um uh my actual home address <laughs> so you can google map it and uh and and for the most part that worked every you know you know i get the occasional person that says oh it's too polished you know it's got to be it's got to be less professional it's like what it's like, yeah really it's yeah. like so anyway, but yeah, uh, it's it's been a it's been an interesting interesting uh, short couple of months. So you know, I think you know in the videos you or in one of the interviews you you've done already that uh, you mentioned that that the the, the censure for you was the was the uh, United Nations map. Yeah, that was the one that took you over the top. That was and, that, yeah, that that in Antarctica, but but yeah, they were they go hand in hand, but yeah, the United Nations uh, uh, flag, uh, and that you know again, I didn't discover that on my own, you know, I built off of, of people like everybody else, uh, and and even I asked you know Matt from the NASA channel, I said, uh, you know, did you were you the first one to bring it up? Because no man, I got I got it from somewhere else, and uh, he didn't say where, but. But yeah, it's a it's a it's a perfect point, which is the Antarctica map is the flat Earth map. I'm sorry, the the UN map is uh, the flat Earth map, and there's no Antarctica on it. Right, and so, it's it's fascinating. So can you explain for for everybody who's listening what mm -hmm. flat Earth looks like? The flat Earth looks like for me, and there's going to be some disagreements. You know, in the in the in the flat Earth movement, as as nuts as that sounds, it's actually a movement. Um, there's there's two schools of thought really. Uh, one is that it's a perfect plane, you know, that it's uh, you know just perfectly flat, with the exception of you know, the ridges and the mountains and stuff like that. Um, but for me, I I try to be a little more flexible, and that was I went with the uh, if anyone wants to look it up online, the flat and stationary Earth model by Orlando Ferguson that he made in uh, 1830 
which is a little more it, it, it helps out a little bit more with the, the moonrise and sunrise and, and sunset and moonset, where it's kind of shaped like a roulette table, where it's kind of got that bulge in the middle around the North Pole. And then, for me, it kind of flattens out a little more. It doesn't dip as much as his and then, you know, raises up naturally because the Antarctic uh, continent is all at, at an elevation of two miles. So that's pretty much what it looks like. And and yet and I've still there's a guy that I'm that I'm dealing with out in uh, Jersey. I hope he makes it. He's trying to to create uh, a more realistic 3D model of it because there just aren't any out there. You know, there's some animations which aren't bad, uh, and you can find those on YouTube. But an actual physical 3D model is almost impossible to find. Right. Yeah. Well, that's so. that that model actually is the one that makes the most sense to me for. Yeah. Just uh, the, what we are able to physically see in our world, you know, the way the, the sun and moon uh, yeah, actually yeah. rotate. Yeah. Yeah. How do you create night and day in a flat, on a flat plane? On a perfectly flat plane, yeah, which was the, the big thing I went with, you know. And again, there's an animation out there. I, I'm not going to reference it right the second. But yeah, if, if you've got kind of a bulge in the center, it really, really helps with the whole sun, you know, dealing with the, the, the issue of having sunrise and moonrise. Because if it's perfectly flat, you got some problems about, too, you know, having too much coverage, in my opinion. So. So, so let's uh, let's hit on a couple of these clues here, so our listeners can go, can uh, get a little bit better idea of what the hell we're talking about and <laughs> why we would be talking about this seriously. Uh-huh. Uh huh. So, uh, how about let's go to Bird. Everybody, you know, I, I would have to say that the majority of our listeners know who Admiral Bird was due to our due to our shows that we have done on hollow earth theories and stuff so yeah yeah okay. the, the the bird wall yeah for me was my absolute point of no return because of that wonderful footage that uh got leaked out you know i think it was by a cbs guy from 1954 from the uh the the show that's not on the air anymore called the long Gines chronoscope horrible horrible name and uh where Admiral Byrd came on television in 1954 and was talking, you know, at that point you got to remember he was a he was an American hero, and he you know he he did you know major press tours and and uh, you know ticker tape parades the whole nine yards, and he came he came on and said that Antarctica was pretty much made out of money, and you know it had all these resources in the world he couldn't he couldn't stop gushing about it that was that was the 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 part that that got me was it's like oh look you know there's their entire ma- mountain range made out of coal there's oil there's minerals there's uranium and you know all these countries are down there all the major powers that were you know survived after world war 2 everybody's you know going to start divvying this thing up and there's you know there's and plus there was an entire chunk of land larger than the entire continental united states which he hadn't even flown over yet and that they were just going to make money and right after that you know, very shortly after, you know, so, and then, so that was in 1954 when he did the interview, he was, and he talked about in the interview, interview how they were prepping for Operation Deep Freeze, which was the United States, you know, big expedition the next year, and then after Operation Deep Freeze, everything changed, and, you know, within a very, very short amount of time, there was a change of, chain of events where the corporations were pretty much, every, the Antarctica was locked down tighter than a drum, and a, a treaty was put in place in 1959, and no one was allowed to do anything there. And from, a, from an economic standpoint, that was just ludicrous. No, no we, we all know how the world works. It is driven off greed and money and power. And they were sealing off all these resources, you know, in 1959. And of course, now it's, there's layers, there's a veneer layer on top of that, on top of the treaty, you know, Environmental Protection uh, Act. And that is that is also just silly because it's like, well, okay, but that doesn't apply in 1959, so why were you sealing off in 1959? No one talks about it. I mean, people don't realize that Greenpeace wasn't even founded until 1971, and that was just, you know, a few hippies in a rubber raft right. you know, back then. So... Uh, it's it goes against for me that it it was a real turning point because again I've watched so much stuff over and, and you guys have too where the corporations can do anything if you have the you know enough money there isn't an, uh, oil companies literally have unlimited power when it comes to getting access to places right. you know they can frack anywhere they want they can go into national parks they can go anywhere they want all they have to do is lobby and you know bribe the right amount of politicians but when it comes to Antarctica literally. They can't even bring the topic up. You cannot. They cannot petition it. Nobody talks about it, 
And it's just amazing to me that, that it's just never been noticed after all this time. Have, have you read the treaty from, uh, what year was that, 59? Uh, 59. I have read quite a bit of it. And, uh, not, you know, not all of it, obviously. I didn't memorize all the, the things. But you, you brought up some of that to me in an email, didn't you? Uh, geez, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, I, but, I, but I did read quite a bit of it. Uh, they sealed off um, pretty much everything. And they, the, 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 the caveats, the, the, big, the big points were that almost you know, since day one was no corporations will get in there. You know, doesn't, you know, there will be no resource gathering at all. And you have ten nations you know, that sign it in the beginning, and then every nation that becomes economically viable – as, you know, as they develop around the world, and there's now 50 nations, every nation that becomes economically viable then has to sign it. Right. How, when, when does that happen? You know, plus it's unilateral on top of it. You know, Russia was trying to rebuild after World War II. You know, uh, England was not in great shape after World War II. They got bombed pretty seriously. Right. And they could have used these resources. You think British Petroleum's not going to go down there? Yeah. Of course they're going to go down there. And uh, so what... What's big, you know, for me, it was so easy. It's like, what's so big that not only are you not, let, you know, what's bigger than money? And what's so big that you can't even come up with a decent cover story? You know, even after all these years, you, you know, you have, you've had decades to come up with a cover story and let people on there, and you still won't do it. Right. Uh, you, know, you know, then, you know, create the GPS system, which I have no doubt, you know, helps, helps that cause. And, uh, you know, just... It's just amazing. It, but, again, it's been hidden so well because, for the most part, the, our attention has been diverted from that part of the world. Right. So why, why would anybody think about it? Right. Yeah, the, uh, playing devil's advocate, there's, there's uh, you know, and this is how I, ha I try to approach my research. You know, I ask, uh, what are the other answers? You know, what sure. are the other answers to this cause? You know, that we have a cause, what, what are, you know, this effect or however we want to term this. Yeah. What are the other answers? What are the other possibilities that are uh, that this is in place down there? Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I looked at just the Antarctica, that treaty, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the things, uh, the first thing that came to mind, and probably the, the strongest one out there in the uh, alternative community, anyways, mm -hmm. has to do with has to be the the Nazis, right? Of course. Of course, and, and there is, you know, if you look into that, there is a lot of evidence out there that they went south, and and I and I would agree with you. However, and and people, I I that's been thrown at me quite a bit. However, the timing was wrong, because uh, Operation High Jump, if you believe in the in the the Nazi theory, and I and I, I lend it some credibility. It's it's very possible that the remaining Nazi Navy went down there and tried to you know make a make a stronghold, but that was in 1946. Right. Uh, Operation High Jump was 1946, and if something really, really bad happened down there in 1946, they would have sealed it off earlier, because by 1954, when Byrd did that interview, you could tell there was he didn't have a care in the world. You know, whatever whatever happened with Operation High Jump, and we're never going to find that out. Whatever happened there, they took care of it. So right. if they had to, you know, if they went toe to toe with the Nazis. Uh, and, you know, didn't want to tell anybody about it, yeah, that's fine. You know, it, were UFOs involved? Yeah, maybe. But whatever it was, they, they took a care of it, and enough time had elapsed that, that you know, by 1954, it was business as usual. And uh, they were going to, you know, and some people, you know, have claimed it's like, oh, Bird had to be a disinfo guy because he was a Mason and he's military. It's like, yeah, 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 fine. You know, m maybe he was. But the hype that he was putting on the economic aspect of it, there'd be no benefit to hype that up because, you know, if anything, it was like, you know, he was getting the corporations ready because, in my mind, they hadn't found it. And I don't think – I think at that point they were going, well, maybe we'll never find it. And, you know, there's there's Murphy's Law because, you know, the very next expedition, you know, they run into it. Right, yeah. So, well, you know, they, you in that in that interview that he does, uh, mm -hmm. he – you can see the enthusi enthusiasm he has for it. He's excited that, oh, yeah. that there's there's all these resources down there. It's like there's enough coal down there to power the planet for yeah, yeah. a or, or, definite period of time. Or that uranium line that he yeah. the, where he was kind of backpilling. He's going, you know, maybe I shouldn't talk about uranium. I don't want people to start fighting over uranium down there. Right. <laughs> it's like, and, you know, again, the unilateral. It's like, again, if it was only America that backed out and pulled out, that's one thing. Right. But to have, you know, every country, there was at least seven nations down there, including, you know, Britain and Russia. You, Russia, really? Russia's going to back out on their own? No. 
No, no, no. It, it okay. just it, it doesn't happen. Here's here's a theory that pops into my head right off the bat. Sure. And, and it, it, they met the caretakers. Very possible. And and you know they the caretaker said this is uh, this is a, a a place you cannot go. Very possible. And and, if you yeah. do, you know you'll be in trouble. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very possible. I thought of that, too, you know, where, you know, if, if it wasn't uh, a passable barrier, maybe it was a guarded barrier. Maybe it was, you know, maybe it was ships on the ice that weren't going to move. Uh, well, you know, if that, if that kind of a group of people are moving down there and we do have uh, some form of caretaker, something that is watching us here, which I'm pretty damn sure that there's something. Yeah. Uh, then they're going to see these people headed to the south. They're going to yeah. see people approaching the wall. Yep. Uh, yep. And if they as, if they get too close, they're going to intervene. Agreed. I I, I do agree with you there. Uh, and then for me, regardless of you know if the caretakers are there or not, or if it's a, if it's a soft boundary or a hard boundary, then it got really interesting because again, all these moves that they made were so decisive. You know where you leave the ice and then you immediately you know Russia and America, the only countries uh, that could do it at the time, immediately just start you know fast tracking the rocket program. Uh, you know, like like their lives depended on it. And then, you know, a year within the rocket program of, of being escalated, they all of a sudden start attaching nukes to them and, and firing them straight up on, you know, from both sides. And, you know, and then immediately after that, you form NASA. 1959, you lock down Antarctica. Uh, and then you keep firing the nukes. Uh, you know, not the big stuff, though. It seemed like they were probing after 1958. And then they both stopped firing on exactly the same day uh, in 1962. Uh, one of the, one of the the, uh, the packages that they were using for the groups of, you know groups of uh, nuclear tests on the American side was ca- called Operation Fishbowl. Where they came up with that name, I have no <laughs> no idea at all. That's, that's oh, oh wow, there, yeah. here's your sign. Yeah, you couldn't you couldn't. It's like really, that's the name you're gonna pick. You couldn't come up with a coded name. And then, um, and you know, the, the, the shots end in 1962. They said, oh, it was a moratorium on aerial testing. No, it wasn't. They both agreed. Yeah, Amer- America and Russia were absolutely in hand-on-hand, you know, uh, on, on that aspect. And, uh, yeah. Anyway, sorry. That was my rant. So do you think Admiral Byrd knew what was down there? And that's why he, he, he gave the hype for, you know, come down here and you'll make money. There's uranium and coal. Do you think that he knew that there was something else down there and he wanted to get more people on board just to get down there to, to figure it's, out what was going it's, on? It's hard to say because, like, if you take an Indiana Jones scenario like that, you don't have to let him in on the loop. Like, for example, let's say, you know, uh, there were ancient societies that, that you, know, you know, you know who we're talking about here, who knew, who had the, who had the old maps. And they they was like okay let's see if this map is true because you did you know you don't know until you know, and so you send them down there starting in 1928 and you just keep sending them out there. There's no there, you don't have to tell him what what you're looking for. All you have to do is tell him go as far as you can and map the whole thing, and then you can keep him out of the loop. And then there's nothing you know he's he's an innocent in it. Um, he, there's no there, let's put it this way there's no benefit to letting him in on it. Right. And so after those first 30 years of explorations where he didn't find anything, you know, four full-blown um, uh, expeditions, including uh, high jump, then at that point you're going, all right, well, again, it's that weird, it's that weird movie thing you can't make up, and that is, yep, he's obviously not finding anything. Let's just call it quits and, and make a ton of money for the next hundred years, and uh, and then of course you know then then it all went wrong the the very next year. So no, the short answer is no. I I do not think he knew until because if he knew. I don't think you dare let him on television to, to start doing that because right. you don't want to you don't want to get the the corporation salivating. It would make no sense. You you do not want to have Exxon and Chevron and British Petroleum and and all the mineral companies you know start you know start drawing up plans, which really that's all was going to happen, and then you know just say oh yeah by the way no one's going there. I, that there had to been some really interesting conversations between execs in 1959 when that whole thing went down. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Because you couldn't tell them either. You just had to say, look, it's a national security issue, and we're not going to talk about it, and if you want some money, it's fine. If you don't, we're going to make you go away. So, yeah. so I wonder with the with the uh, aerial nuke stuff, if they were able to actually uh, 
and this you probably won't be able to answer, but I, I'm wondering if they were, they were able to actually get any kind of a, a good picture of what the, the dome looked like. I, I think they could get the, the – I think after the first ones, because you, if you look at the tests, and you can you know, Google this, this is you know, at least the public test, uh, high-altitude nuclear explosions, it looked like you – know, if, yeah, if you used aerial bursts, you could, you could get a pretty good idea, if, you, if your cameras were good enough, of the arc. You know, all you have to do is, you know, test arcs in different places. And, you know, so you got America on one side and Russia on the other side. Uh, between the two of them, if they were sharing data, which I think they were, you could you could paint a pretty good picture, uh, especially since the, the nukes they were using after 1958, most of them were pretty small, um, less than a megaton for almost all of them, except for those two really, really big shots in 1958, which were, I think, 3.8 megaton apiece, which were monstrous for 1958. I mean, I think those are the biggest things we could build. So. I wonder if any of them, uh, and, and I haven't really looked into the, the nuke aspect of this uh, yeah. very closely, uh, or as far as launch sites and, and where the, all these happened at. I'm curious if any of them happened uh, in the, uh, the, the lower latitudes. Um, I don't know about the Russian stuff, but most of the American stuff, and again, if you want to watch the, uh, and we're not getting to the debate on if, if nukes were, were real or not, um, uh, watch uh, Trinity and Beyond, uh, a wonderful documentary that was done by William Shatner some years ago. Or, you know, I'm sorry, he narrated. I, the, there was a guy from uh, Lucas Lucas Films that, uh, that that put it together. But most of those, sh- most of the American shots were in the uh, South Pacific. Right. Uh, and, and, so, and, and there's some great pictures of, um, of them shooting. It, they were close enough to, in some cases, to where Hawaii could see the, uh, see the blast. Right. So. Right. All right. So, you guys, anything on? Well, the... I, I would like if you can explain how this flat Earth theory you know, sort of paint a picture in my head how it works. Okay. Compared to how we think this Earth, round Earth theory works, how does this? Make... Com- compare it to you know the 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 real super easy re- uh, uh, analogy I'd use, and I did this in uh, Clue. Four called Shell Beach is really the one that most people gravitate to because I, I get it quoted to me in email all, all the time is the Truman Show, which is just a large, large version of the Truman Show. Let's say the Truman Show was uh, uh, 20 miles across, and and you know if you're trying to visualize it, it's flat-ish on the on on the ground, and then it's surrounded by a giant solid structure that can be projected on either from behind, you know, from underneath or behind. I'd prefer behind to where. It simulates you being in an open space. Uh, no different than, you know, if you guys have ever been to Disneyland, I, I, I don't think I've thrown out this reference, go, go do the old um, Pirates of the Caribbean ride from the 1950s. You know, it's a bl- wonderful thing. Your, your, your boat's going through this thing. If you look up at the ceiling uh, and your eyes are adjusted, you know, you, you see absolute depth. You think there's stars and planets and it's a beautiful, beautiful setting, but you're just in a sound stage. That's all you're in. Now, expand that to... The structure, in our case, let's say 8,000 miles wide. Yeah. And if you have a structure that wide, you wouldn't even need to do it that high. Most people think, oh, you know, it's like a snow globe thing where, you know, it's it's 8,000 miles wide and 6,000 miles high. No, you know, you don't have to do it. It would actually resemble more of like a, like a football stadium where you'd only have to have it, say, 400 miles high, which is actually, you know, compared to 8,000 miles wide, that's a really low uh, ceiling, but since commercial traffic caps out at about 10 miles, uh, you know everything above, and then spy planes, I don't know, 20 miles, give or take. Um, you know everything else is is almost impossible for 99.99 percent of the population to even consider. Right. With the exception of these uh, the rare public space programs that are having um, oh so much fun as of late. Yeah. yeah. So does that does that does that kind of help? Yes. That, thank you. Yeah. Okay. It does. Uh, so it's kind of, you know, I, I, I have things like uh, so many of these uh, conspiracies and, and theories that have been that bandered, bandered around for the, the last five or six years about Nibiru, you know, the oh, yeah. Planet X, and, and people getting these photographs of the shadow moon or the planet next to the sun. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm just, I, I see these, and most of these shots are all when the sun's, you know, fairly close to the horizon. Yep. Uh, within, you know, say, I'd say probably most of them are within 20 degrees of horizon. Yep. And, and if, if I, 
when I take that and I overlay it on on a uh, you know flat Earth theory, yeah. you know, well, geez, you know that almost um, kind of explains itself. We got a little bit of refraction or reflection off of the dome that you know is only seen at a certain angle. And there you go. Um, yeah, yeah. If the sun is way, way closer that you know, if it is not 92 million miles away, if it's less than a thousand miles away then all that activity, because I always wondered that too when I was looking, I, I probably saw the same stuff you did, where you see these objects that are really close to the sun, but they're right. pretty big, and you're going, those, if those are ships, they're as big as, a, as, big as Jupiter. Right. You know, if this is a planet, is it's you know three quarters the size of the sun. Yeah, it's monstrous. Oh. You know, some of the stuff was really really big, but that all changes if it's an enclosed system, because then that th that object becomes way way smaller, uh, and closer, and and uh, yeah, then it yeah it changes the whole perspective. As far as Nibiru goes, uh, boy, that's going to be an interesting one because you know if let's let's put it this way, if there is some sort of weird event. Where Nibiru, you know, comes all of a sudden you see it in the sky and all this. At that point, I think it'd be just a brilliant uh, example of, of something that's staged. Uh, because again, it, even that would reinforce the globe model. Uh, as I mentioned to somebody else the other day, was, you know, when we see, I think some of the stuff, uh, this is the clever side, you know, yes, a lot of the stuff that NASA does is ridiculous and stupid, but some of the stuff they do is pretty clever, like the face on Mars or that weird hexagon on top of Saturn, because. As soon as you look at the face on Mars and think, hey, that's pretty interesting, wonder what that's all about, as soon as you acknowledge that, where you are now instantly becomes a globe by assumption. You, you immediately think, I'm looking at a cool thing on Mars because I'm on Earth and it's a globe. But so if you release stories like that on a regular basis, you know, oh, we're doing a probe like this. Oh, hey, by the way, the Mars rover is still working even though it's supposed to be dead seven years ago. Uh, it automatically kicks your mind into um, into the globe model, right. you know, which which is why those um, uh, you know people like I had an email uh, a couple days ago where someone was saying that, uh, or no, it was a post on YouTube where they were saying, oh yeah, Mark forgot about these these movies that were about the moon missions, and one was called Moon and one was called, um, oh crap, what was the other one? Uh, I can't remember off the top end, but but Moon was uh, a movie, a science fiction movie. Oh, the other one was Apollo 18. Uh, Moon was a science fiction movie done in 2009, where you know uh, where there were clones on the moon, and Apollo 18, which didn't exist in real life, you know, Apollo 18 never happened, was about little crab monsters that uh, disguised right. them disguised themselves as moon rocks. It's like really, it, it, you guys are falling right into what I'm saying here, and that is there are movies out there that you think are real and they're not. So. Right. Anyway. anyway. Right. Well, I, you know, I am an amateur astro astronomer. Okay. And you know, I've got a, a nice eight-inch Celestron telescope, and cool. I'm able. I've, you know, I, I've had my eye on quite a few of the planets. Well, majority of the planets that are visible. Uh, yeah. I, I haven't got out to obviously haven't been able to pinpoint Pluto. <laughs> it's a little <laughs> rough to hit with a, a eight inch telescope. Sure. But you know, when I when I just look at the the closer planets, the Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, the Moon. Mm -hmm. uh, moon's probably my most favorite one to to look at. I mean, because there's some bizarre anomalies there. Yeah. Um, you know, and and the Moon is probably the, the easiest one to actually see this on. But I can uh, see the curvature and the spherical shape of the moon through the telescope. You know, yes. without a doubt, it is very, if it's if it's just a projection, it's a freaking amazing job at a projection. Um, so uh, yeah. so doing, doing, looking at that stuff and being seeing it with my own eyes and through my own gear and my, you know, uh, undoubtedly no tampering involved there on this end. Uh, when I look at this stuff, and it's in plain sight that the, I have to acknowledge, at least with a 99% certainty, that there is a physical object there that I'm looking at. Agreed. Agreed. And and I've had, in fact, I had a round table uh, a couple days ago where a guy from Australia was was saying, you know, do you, he was actually, you know, trying to trying to nail me down. And he said, you know, do you think the moon is a three dimensional object? And I go, yes, absolutely, I do. I go, it's, I go, I think there's something being overlaid on the top of it now, you know, after watching some of the YouTube stuff. But I absolutely think it's a three dimensional object as well as the sun. And you'd really, in a flat model, 
and I'm not stealing from I'm not stealing from the original flat model stuff that's out there like Orlando Ferguson, but you want those things to be three dimensional objects because they're big enough in the sky that they're going to show so much more detail that you really need the extra production on it. You 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 don't want to play it off like Saturn or Jupiter, you know, especially with the moon. You know, the sun it's a little tougher because you know you're nobody's staring at the sun with a telescope most of the time anyway. But the moon, you know, is but the most photographed object uh, I think of all time. And it, you need the extra detail. And only now does it seem, you know, especially with the videos that are out there on YouTube, does it seem that our camera technology, especially HD technology, seems to be catching up with whatever technology is being used for the projection system. Uh, and I'll, I'll quote the lunar waves, and that is, you know, imagine if our HD technology was only a few milliseconds behind the refresh rate of whatever is being used for that for that moon object. Uh, which is why we seem to be filing, you know, finding some chinks in the uh, in the armor here. Right, right. Yeah, and and for you guys out there listening, uh, uh, there's a, a guy out there on YouTube that's doing some amazing videos. He's got some pretty good, uh, pretty good shots of a a kind of a distortion wave that goes across the face of the moon. Uh, his uh, YouTube is uh, Crow C R R O W triple seven. Uh, and I'll, I'll throw a link to that, his uh, YouTube on this show page also for you guys. So yeah, he's got some good information there. Yeah, and I and I reference him even though he's not a flat earther yet, uh, and I haven't reached out to him or anything. You know, I'm going to let him find this out on his own, but uh, the stuff that he's looking at dovetails perfectly into the model that I'm using. It, it's just, you know, it's like, look, the moon is not what you think it is, and it just falls in line with everything else that you don't think what it is. So, Right. So... Uh, let's go on the assumption that we are living in some sort of a, a contained environment uh-huh. and uh, a dome or layered or how would you picture that? How would you picture it as, a, as like a just a dome or a screen or would you it, it, if it's if, layered similar to the the uh, models that came come out of ancient India? Uh, oh, you mean like the uh, the world elephant? One of those right, things. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, by the way, the world elephant's a wonderful little uh, depiction. Even though I don't necessarily, you know, if it's if it's on the back of elephants, that's on the back of a giant turtle. You know, that's one thing. But what I think was interesting about the world elephant, little side note, is that um, uh, it's mentioned. If you look it up on Wikipedia, that uh, it had a reference in the first paragraph to Al Biruni. In, in, in did he cite any of the world elephant stuff in his literature? And I was going, why why would you reference this guy? You know, I didn't think it was a coincidence. You know, Al Biruni was the guy that proposed the map that the United Nations uses for their flag in the USGS, and also Al Biruni, the same guy who NASA named a moon crater after. You know, after and you know he's tied to the world ele- elephant, which is just bizarre. Um, for me, though, the, the, the dome, you know, what I consider to be a very well-cloaked structure, I had a guy from uh, Austria call me recently, and he goes, he goes well, if, if, the, if the structure out, you know, in Antarctica, you know, goes straight up or, you know, at a, at a very slight curve and it goes up hundreds of kilometers, you should be able to see it from uh, quite a distance. You know, you know, even if you were on the edge of Antarctica, you might be able to see it. I said, well, no, because you'd cloak it. You know, you it, same as the Truman Show. You're not going to just, you know, paint a black. It's not going to be a black dome. It's going to be, you know, translucent in in some in some aspect. Um, but as far as the overall layout, it would for me it would you know because I tried to design this thing from scratch, coming from a game design background. Uh, you'd have again whatever material it's out of. You know, is it an energy material? Is it a super heavy element? Well, not sure, but it's apparently immune to nuclear weapons. Uh, and then on the top of it, you know, you have layers and layers of projection systems uh, pointing at it, you know, so you can project in 2D or 3D, you know, the stars and planets, you know, and you wouldn't even have to, I would use some sort of holographic imaging program because that'll, that'll give you some, some added depth to the system. So it doesn't appear like, you know, just a, just a beautiful painting or a beautiful rendered image. It would be, you know, stars layered upon stars, laying apart stars. And if that takes miles to do, well, you've got the room and the technology to do it. Uh, and then that goes out to some degree and 
after that, well, then then it's you know anybody's guess. You know, is it? You know, there's some people said, okay, you know, if it's if it's a thin dome like structure, is it is is there another side to the coin? Literally, you know, if the if you didn't want to waste space or resources, is there another another dome that's facing the other direction on the other side? It's very possible. Or are you in a in a giant room with more you know domes? And and for me, I love that idea because if you're going to build one, you know, you're not going to just build one. You're going to build more. Right. You're going to build several, and, and you're going to have all sorts of fun stuff. But for me, when I made the clues, I tried to get people not to stretch their mind too far because this topic as itself is is quite a mind bender. Oh, so. yeah. <laughs> so what does gravity do <clears throat> the uh, closer you get to, the, to Antarctica? What are the effects of gravity? Oh, well, it... it when as close as you get to Antarctica, it shouldn't make any difference because and I, people have asked, you know, is it uh, would it be spinning? You know, like a, like is the is the ground spinning like a merry ground? And I've seen other people do theories like that. It's like, well, it's not the way I'd go because if you if because yeah, if if that was as you moved out towards Antarctica, you'd run into more and more centrifugal force. Uh, right. I'm sorry. What? It would just seem like you'd get thrown off. Well, not necessarily thrown off, but thrown straight into straight into the wall. Plus, you've run into stuff like um, uh, the oceans. And again, you know, you want to get into some weird stuff. Ask a scientist sometime how centrifugal force w- works on a globe, because if it's supposed to also be spinning like a merry-go-round, then why are, aren't the oceans pulled up at the center in this you know this giant ball of water? You know, this giant strip of water around the middle. Um, so well, no, like I don't. Going, we're only going at what. Uh, a thousand miles an hour. Oh yeah, it's only a thousand miles an hour. I mean, what what could that do? You know, it's, that that should be nothing, right? But you know, thousand miles an hour still generates. It do, again, you don't. It doesn't have to generate so much torque, but a thousand miles an hour is still enough to 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 do something when it comes to the to water and the oceans. So I'm sorry. Answer your question. Uh, nothing. Nothing. You know, if if it's a if it's a stationary enclosed system, gravity. Wouldn't be any different out at the uh, out at the outer edge. So, and and this is another one that I haven't looked into, and I don't even know if there's any data out there. Uh, I'm guessing there probably is about uh, uh, the gravitational forces on the planet right now. I mean, if say considering it, a, a, let's look at it as a sphere. Is yeah. there difference in gravitational forces from say the equator to the pole? That's an excellent question, and nobody nobody seems to want to address it from a scientific standpoint, which is, uh, again, it's that centrifugal force thing, where is uh, centrifugal force is going to fight gravity. You know, it does in a merry-go-round. You stand on the edge of a merry-go-round, it is going to try to throw you off. If you take a 100-pound weight and put it on the North Pole, technically, there's no real centrifugal, if it's a globe, there's no real centrifugal force there. A 100-pound weight will weigh 100 pounds. But if you take that same weight and take it down to the equator, it should weigh somewhat less. And, and scientists will say, oh, well, you know, it's not going to weigh that much less. Well, yeah, we've got some pretty precision instruments here. And you can't tell me that a 1,000 miles an hour centrifugal force isn't going to affect that weight. Uh, to, to a certain degree. And if that means it's only a couple ounces per 100 pounds, it still should be measurable. And nobody um, nobody addresses it. It's a good yeah, point. That would be an interesting one for uh, So I know we've got uh, several scientists that actually are avid listeners of the show. Uh, come on, guys. Yeah. See some data. It's going to be something, and I don't care. I don't care if it's a fraction of an ounce. It should be measurable because if it isn't, you're going to lose either way on the science standpoint. If if it isn't measurable, then you have to explain why centrifugal force is not affecting gravity. And if it is, you know, then then it should be proven. So they're going to be stuck either way. But again, the natural, the way this place was built, it naturally stops stuff like that. You know, there's a, a between mostly with climate and uh, altitude, you know, and, and oxygen levels, because how many people are, are going to get the chance to go to a North Pole and and you know a, ever in their lives, and then how many people are gonna, actually going to go up just to take a hundred pound weight and then take that same you know hundred pound weight down to the uh, uh, down to the equator? Because unfortunately, you have to use the same one, otherwise, you know, people will say, well, you're using right. different objects. So. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I would think you could do it even within a. You should be a, should be some measurable effect even within, say, a, a thousand, two thousand mile difference. You're right. You're right. Centrifugal force uh, up here in the northern hemisphere. Yeah, it's not spinning at a thousand miles an hour, and I can't remember what the ratio is. It like New York or Los Angeles, but it's going to be um, definitely hundreds of miles an hour. You know, maybe five hundred, six hundred. 
Yeah. Miles an hour? Yeah, there should be something. Yeah. Hmm. That'd be an interesting one to try. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have a feeling it's it wouldn't make any difference, and that would lead cred- credence to uh, flat Earth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and there was a guy that suggested. You know, if it actually was real, then then the super clever uh, rich people, what what you do is, you know, you'd buy gold in the southern, you know, near the equator, and then sell right. it sell it north, you know, when it's heavier. Right. Well, that's that's actually pretty clever. But you know, we would have heard of that about that by now. <laughs> oh, geez, let's see, where next? Um, take your pick. Take my pick. <laughs> Well, let, let's just take a uh, let's let's go real quick over the maps. I mean, we mentioned sure. we mentioned the the uh, UN flag. Yep. Um, when she thought about all the different versions we have here in in and uh, a little bit of the history there. Sure, sure. Um, the the clue three that I did map makers that was a lot of fun because even though for me I was already hooked by number two. Map makers was a lot of fun because I was digging up stuff at that point that I didn't even know existed, which uh, the biggest being was the the map projections. Uh, the and people out there that that haven't figured this out yet, if you wiki the flat Earth Society, you'll see a map there, and it's a top down view of the Earth. You know, it's like a squished globe from the North Pole. So the North Pole is the center of a big circle, and then the continents are are surrounded by that, and then the outer edge is just one big ring of ocean, and then Antarctica is literally stretched as a giant uh, icy ring around the entire thing, and that's the flat Earth map. You're thinking, well, that that works, but the exact same map is in the official wiki list of map projections. And the only one in there, which is of note, is the uh, azimuthal equidistant map, which is about, I don't know, three-quarters down the page. And it's a circular map, and, you, and, it, and it doesn't mean much to you, but it looks exactly like the Flat Earth map. And then you look at the links to it, and those are even more interesting, which is the, um, uh, the fact that, one, it was proposed a thousand years ago by a Persian scientist. Uh, for those people who don't know their history, Persia became Iran later. Unless I'm wrong, I know I'm pretty sure it became Iran later. But a Persian scientist um, named Al Biruni, his full name I'm, I'm not going to pronounce because I'll just massacre it. And Al Biruni uh, was he, you know, he proposed this map, even though the map, this map projection style, even though the map officially couldn't be finished. So the question is, why is the United States Geologic Survey, you know, a giant um, a U- United States branch? government branch, why is that map being used by them as their official view on the world? And why is that map also being used as the UN? Uh, and a guy pointed out to me the other day, he's going, you know, that map was actually proposed for the U- it, it became the UN flag during Operation High Jump. I thought that was kind of interesting. Really? Yeah, huh. yeah, he pointed that out. I'm, and I was trying to figure out the connection. It's like, okay, maybe they were jumping the gun a bit. And maybe they knew eventually Bird would find it. But for me, it was like, oh, I just think they were jumping the gun. It was like, you know, maybe they knew, but again, you still don't know until you know. Um, what else, I, you know, is very interesting, and I'll, I'll actually do this in uh, Clue 12 when, when I put it together. I'm doing something a little different with Clue 12. But, it, you know, it, it kind of bugged me in the map projections. You know, like most people don't understand that the, the classroom map that you see that covers your blackboard that gets pulled down uh, is called the Mercator map. And even that map is extremely wrong. You know, that is not the map, that is not the accurate uh, depiction of the world, but it is the, is what the authority has determined we are so much more comfortable with. You ask any scientist, they'll say, oh, yeah, no, that map is completely wrong. It's, it, we should be using the Gall-Peters map, uh, G-A-L-L uh, space Peters map, and that shows the accurate depiction of how countries are, you know, the size comparison. You know, like South America is monstrous on the on the Gall-Peters map, which is exactly how it would be. And the most notable one, when we're growing up, we see Greenland on that map that's on our blackboard now. We say, oh, wow, Greenland's just about as big as Africa, but Africa is 17 times larger than Greenland. So why are we looking at this map? And the point I'm getting at here is, and I'll bring this up in the next clue that I do, is that the governments and the authority, they won't even let us see that. They're trying to introduce that in school. The scientists absolutely know that the Mercator map is wrong, but they won't even change that. And so people say, oh, why would they hide it, you know, hide, you know, the world view from us? And if it was an enclosed system, it's going, are you kidding? They won't even change the school map to reflect accurate distances. You know, don't, don't, don't tell me what they won't do, because they absolutely will not, you know, show this voluntarily. So. Yeah, you know another one of the 
one of the clues that are out there that that kind of blew me away is the airline thing in the southern hemisphere. Oh, I lucked out with that one. Oh, I was God. I was so I was so happy to find that. In fact, I was happy twice because um, the first one was uh, clue clue seven, which was the long haul. There was a there was a German guy that put out some YouTube videos and it was all in German text, but I could understand the um, uh, the screenshots he was putting up and he was saying, look, the the connections in the southern hemisphere are all wrong, and he, it didn't make sense to him. And for those out there uh, listening who don't understand, um, in the northern hemisphere we take nonstops for granted. You know, it's not even a question of getting a nonstop flight. If you want to fly from wherever you are to, you know, New York or Los Angeles or wherever, you can, it's not even a question of getting a nonstop. It's just how cheap you're going to get it. In the southern hemisphere, though, for whatever reason, 95% of the flights are not nonstop. And by that, I mean mostly uh, anything near Australia and anything in South America, including New Zealand. There just aren't any nonstops. I mean, you could find just a handful, and I cannot tell you how many people sent sent the Santiago, Chile to Auckland, New Zealand flight to me after I did Clue 7, but we'll get to that in a second. But the connections, they send you all over the place. So from Australia to South America, it's only 7,400 miles, and it should be a straight shot across the South Pacific Ocean. But for whatever reason, they just kept bouncing you off of all these different cities. And it and it just didn't it didn't make any sense to me until I started looking at it from a flat map because the, all the connections on a flat map in the southern hemisphere line up they're 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 extremely efficient but only if you use an actual literal flat map like the um, uh, azimuthal uh, equidistant map and so that was just first the first part of it and that was the connections so it was it was part of the the three rules but the biggest rule if if the world is enclosed and they're trying to hide it is the southern hemisphere plane routes will be wrong and they were they were all wrong they were dead wrong they were they were sending connections all over the place so after i did clue 7 people are saying you know i i i, I love people's logic cuz sometimes it just baffles me you know they're saying oh there's these there's these nonstop flights you know there's 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 like five of them in the entire southern hemisphere and it's like so you know you have a handful of nonstop flights that doesn't bug you you're just going to put that in my face and say oh there's nonstop flights so it's like okay i'll figure out what's going on so because it it, it couldn't happen you can't have a nonstop flight that crosses that ocean it just it just c- cannot happen so I start staring at some of the the real time tracker systems. So the GPS, the United States Department of Defense uh, GPS system, they let that data leak out to uh, various websites around you know the world, so that people can watch planes. You know, so if you're watching your family fly from New York to Los Angeles, you know you can you can watch that plane in real time. Um, but it's global. You can you know GPS global positioning system. And I was watching all these flights in the um, southern hemisphere, anything below the equator. And I was looking for these nonstop flights, and I was staring at them for a few days, and nothing was showing up on the screen. You know, there was nothing crossing these oceans. People can open up, you know, anyone, you know, the one I, I tend to point at is planefinder.net. You can open it up right now. And there's um, there's nothing in these three oceans, the South Pacific, the South Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean. I was going, and after a few days, you know, it all of a sudden hit me. It's like, wait a minute, there should be something in those oceans because connections at least are going to start going through there. And there wasn't. And then I started looking at the plane flights themselves. And as they were leaving cities from anywhere in the southern hemisphere, as soon as they got over open water, the planes would blink out and disappear. And then I saw what was happening. And it's like, oh, I got gotcha. you. It was it was overkill, but it was very effective. In that, if you had some nonstop flights and you couldn't show the routes you had to make sure those routes weren't seen by anybody. So you make the, the, the planes fall off the GPS system entirely. You'd blink out the planes, and you'd literally make them disappear until the plane was almost to its destination, no matter where it was. And then an hour before it landed, the plane would reappear, and then the pl- plane would land. And their logic as well. It obviously made it from point A to point B, so therefore the flight exists, and, and uh, you know everything's, everything's fine. But what they're not telling you is how, they, how the plane got there. And they can't because the the route that the planes take do not make any sense uh, on a uh, on a globe. They, they do not make sense. They only make sense on a flat map. But so their their answer was they're just not going to show it to you. Yeah. So. Did did uh, any of those that handful of nonstops that uh, they sent you uh, have flight times with them? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There was there were some flight times, uh, but 
again, the, the flight times actually matched up pretty well if you were taking the shortcut. You know, if you were crossing, if you were using the uh, the the azimuthal map, those flight times actually worked for the most part. Um, but again, you know, people would, I, I cannot tell you how many times, oh, yeah, the, again, why is there only one flight that everyone quotes me? You know, the Santiago, Chile to Auckland, New Zealand. Wait, there's no other nonstop flights out there, but they kept quoting that one. I was going, yeah, fine. You know, my answer was always the same. You know, show me how it got there. Don't tell me that it landed. Tell me how it got there, because I absolutely know for a fact uh, it couldn't have gone over the ocean, because on the Azimuthal map, the ocean, the, the route is not 7,400 miles uh, across an open ocean. That ocean becomes, is stretched and is much, much longer. It's, it's, more, it's over 10,000 miles long. And so no plane, you know, there's, you know, there's limits to, to plane distance, you know, even with long distance, um, long haul planes. Uh, it, it, you can't use it. You have to take the, you know, order to keep everybody on the same page. You have to take the, the, the quickest route. And they've been lucky for all these years. You know, the pilots don't care. You know, it's on autopilot. Passengers, they're just sleeping or getting, dr you know, drunk in their seats. So nobody's nobody's really picked up on it. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, that, that'd be one that I'd be curious to, uh, well, you know, for... for those flight times to be anywhere near uh, respectable as far as the globe model is concerned, yeah, uh, they would have to have uh, a, a few jets that were able to exceed the what is the triple seven at now? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. seventy or 60, 80 miles an hour. Or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd have to punch it, you know, and and hope that you can make up the time, but. It's just not feasible. Uh, you know, the pilots would notice that more than they would uh, other things. And again, you know, nowadays, uh, the GPS system takes over as soon as they, you know, as soon as they lift off. You know, as soon as they get to like twenty thousand feet, with is, you know, with is is not very far from the airport at all. They just flip the switch and GPS does the rest. Pilots, you know, just start, you know, listening to books on tape and. You know, thinking about where, what hotel they're going to stay in. You know, when they land, it's it's they don't they don't the pilots don't necessarily care. And which I touched on in the videos because people say, oh, the pilots are absolutely going to know. It's like no, because think of the think of the leap of faith that they would have to make from their point of view. You know, even if they look down below and realize that the, that what was down below their plane didn't make sense. Who one? Who are they going to tell? You, you really going to call the FAA? You, you, what are you going to tell them? You going to tell them the map's wrong? You, right. you, and plus, there's again that that's that massive leap of faith because you, they they've got like a whole list of things. Well, maybe I dozed off. Maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe I'm confused. But the last, I mean, it's not even on the list. It's it's so far beyond below the list. It's on the floor, and that is no pilot is going to make the jump to flat Earth. They're never <laughs> ever going to do it. And if they did. They, they, you know, the, they'd be benched. They'd be fired immediately. It'd be worse than if they, they might as well literally have said, oh, "By the way, a UFO was chasing us for the last right. two hours." Right, right, right. You'd, you'd be actually ridiculed less for that. Yeah, actually, your pilots are managing to keep their jobs nowadays by saying that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, at least more so than they they have in the past. Mm-hmm. So what else you wanna? So. Uh, well, okay, let's let's take this to, you know, uh, the what the hell does all this mean level. Okay. I mean, because, uh, you know, especially uh, so many people nowadays, we are, we're in what, what everybody's calling the great wake, uh, the ascension process or whatever we want to term it in whichever school you happen to be following. Yeah. Um, you know, there is a definite spiritual renaissance happening on the planet. Agreed. Where people are getting connected to themselves, getting connected to spirit, uh, getting connected to, you know, God. Yep. Um, you know, it, within this, um, you know, if, if we change a real very fundamental uh, assumption that we've made through you know, for at least the last 500 years about the environment that we are existing in, uh, and that is brought into question. Yeah. That, that has a, a ripple effect through practically everything that, that we're, we're experiencing here. I mean, I, it, when, when I really, uh, when I watched, first watched these clues, and, and at that point there were 10 when yeah. the first time I watched it. Yeah. Uh, it, it actually, really shook up my whole 
paradigm and as far as the whole spiritual hierarchy and and the the stuff that I've been communicating with, the stuff that I'm able to tap into. Mm-hmm. And and the big question that popped into my mind is, oh my God! Well, these guys haven't told me that I'm not living on a globe. You know, I I mean, I suppose I haven't at, may, never really asked that question. <laughs> you know, I've never said, uh, hey, uh, uh, Michael, uh, do I live on a globe or is this a flat Earth? Um, which is is something that I've I've been actually uh, working on on in my meditations here recently. Sure, uh, but. But what's that? What's that do to our the whole spiritual awakening happening on the planet? It's an excellent point, which you know I, I tried to touch on in uh, number ten and eleven. You know, because, because by the time I got there, I was not necessarily pulling away from number five, where where I went in a status quo, because I initially had the same reaction to it as you know I tried to put myself in other people's shoes, and so when I was trying to put myself in the authorities' shoes. I immediately thought, well, if this happens, you know, if this is revealed, and I absolutely agree with you, you know, there's there's things in play here, you know, there's this thing's getting traction for a reason. I do not know exactly why. It could be a disclosure part of it, you know, it could be an awakening. But my initial reaction was that, you know, it, it could be a knee jerk snap kick from religion if if they're if they if they're led into this. You know, from a spirituality standpoint, unfortunately there there's a tendency for payback. And that is, you know, well, you know, science has been beating us down for for centuries, and now, you know, all of a sudden, it's like science will have to come forward and say, oh yeah, by the way, we've been we've been, you know, it's been hidden from you by us for the last six decades, and you know, deliberately because we didn't want, you know, to let you know the spirituality aspect of of people to come forward and to have this big shift towards religion. But by the time I got to number ten and eleven, I really was thinking, okay. If this is the case, you know, if this this is what we're we're meant, you know, if this is part to be part of a big disclosure process, maybe that will be tempered because it's not just that uh, the true nature of the world would be revealed, but also that we're not alone and we never were alone. And it for me, it wasn't just a comforting feeling. It was, oh hey, by the way, there's been someone looking over your shoulder, making sure you know, you know, just checking up on you and. Once people realize that's real, and I, I hate to diminish it by using the Santa Claus argument, but I but I think it applies, and and a lot of people can relate to it. And that is, the naughty and nice list doesn't really mean anything until you actually see Santa Claus standing in front of the fireplace, and then it does mean something. Uh, meaning people all of a sudden become accountable for their actions, and. Uh, you know all the all the malicious things that we've done to each other over the years that comes into play. It's like you know it, it, again, it's one thing if you're ignorant and naive and you and you don't know. People have faith in God, fantastic, wonderful. Um, but you know you know, but nobody has a tangible, you know, rock solid proof. You can't walk up to you know, no one's been able to walk up to you know to a wall or a barrier with God's handprint on it. And if they know it's there. Then people, in my opinion, become better. I, I think we become better as a, as a civilization, as a society. Um, you know, some people say, um, "Well, you know, oh, that's it's an aspect of Big Brother and it's oppressive." And it's like, no, no, it isn't. And and which is why I gave the the stoplight argument. And I say, okay, everyone's run a stoplight, but if there's a camera at that stoplight, you don't run it. And I say, why? Why don't you? And so, well, because I'll get caught. You know, it's like, well. Then why were you thinking about running in the first place? <laughs> you know it's wrong, but so why are you still running it? And you know you apl- you can apply that to all sorts of things. You know it's like really, are you going to gun somebody down the street if uh, if you know that there may be a scorecard involved? You know that that someone may you know may be watching. Again, it's not even that 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 you're being watched or you're being looked after or looked over. It's the possibility of it. Because if it's a if it's an enclosed structure, if it's real, then the creation uh, story becomes solidified. And if that's the case, we act better than we are now. Mm. So that that was by the time I got to number eleven, I was like, you know, what, I'm going to go all positive positive with this, and I'm not going to do the the doom and gloom route, which so many people would do. You know, they're saying, oh, it'll be the end of the world, and people will destroy, it, and they'll burn the cities down. I'm going, no, no, that's not the case. Uh, if anything. It'll get real strange. I mean, you'll have you'll have pilgr- pilgrimages to I pronounced that wrong to uh, the ice. You know, churches will be built out in Antarctica. 
Uh, no question. You know, the, you know, the people, uh, all these religious organizations will be asking permission of governments. It's like, look, can we, you know, take a trip out to see it, you know, ourselves? And, uh, you know, I, I, again, it's spiritually, I think it'd be a, a fantastic, you know, time to, to be alive. Yeah. So, so have, have you done any, any research into the um, um, hollow earth theory? And absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I was a hollow earth guy, oh, geez, uh, 10, 10 years ago. Maybe a little more to the point where you know I even uh, I, I I took uh, a girlfriend I was dating at the time out to Mount Shasta, and we went you know cave hunting looking for the mysterious uh, you know some of the entrances you know that were supposedly out near Mount Shasta. But uh, as far as Hollow Earth goes, it does not conflict with. And for those out there who are professing you know perfect plain uh, flat Earth theory, you know, the, the hollow Earth thing works a lot better if there's a bulge in the center near the North Pole, you know, where Admiral Byrd, again, that's where I started with Admiral Byrd, because he's, you know, he's a legend for the hollow Earth community. Um, if it's a bulge center, then that bulge has way more room than you would need for some sort of ancient civilization or an older version of us. Uh, to, to maintain a system. You know, it doesn't have to be a, a you know, the Earth doesn't have to be completely hollow where you go in, you know, it's 8,000 miles deep. Uh, a bulge would be, you know, is bigger than most countries and you could you could put a lot of people in there. So, yeah, I'm totally into the hollow Earth thing. I totally dig it. What do you think about the, the hollow Earth being the flip side to the coin? Also, also like that, too. Someone brought that up to me last week and uh, I also very possible. Uh, again, I, I love the I love not wasting resources when it comes to this, and from an enclosed standpoint, this model is so efficient that it would not surprise me at all if there was a flip side to it. Um, efficiencies, you know, in the enclosed system we have, it, it, it's it's staggering to watch. You know, to look at it from the from the azimuthal map from the top town point of view, where you have the you know the the um, Continents organically clustered in the center, surrounded by a massive body of 3% solution salt water, which people think, oh, you know, that's just a natural process. No, 3% solution salt water is genius because it means that ocean discovery voyages are limited by, re reduced by 95% because you can't drink the water that you're sailing on. Um, and then you reduce the temperatures to the outer barriers to the point you, know, you get around 15 degrees where icebergs start forming. And then if you make it past that, you've got you know a two-mile high plateaued uh, continent, which you know goes all the way around. And then you know there's probably a couple hundred mile buffer zone at least before you get to anything. You know before you get to the turnback signs of the barrier. Uh, and then you know the decreasing oxygen levels that happens very very quickly. Uh, you know you you can get altitude altitude sickness uh, in under two miles. You know, when you're going up, so there's mountains. You know, we can't, we cannot climb to the top without oxygen. And, uh, it, again, it's just a fascinating, efficient design. But to your point, yeah, I could absolutely see it to where this thing had a flip side of the coin. Sure. Hmm. Sure. So um, I'm thinking we're talking about a, the uh, uh, ocean currents. Yeah. So the, the ocean currents as we see them now, um, what what would be Generating them. I mean, is there some some type of system, you know, deep in the in the, in the trenches of the ocean that that caused them to to? Oh sure. I think think of all the technology we have now. I mean, you're talking about the underwater conveyor system. Yeah. Um, from a from a everything we can do now. I, I I probably shouldn't diminish it by using something silly like uh, the jets in a hot tub, but. Imagine if you could scale up underwater an underwater jet system that's you know to to incorporate ocean you know ocean environment that was eight thousand miles wide and and it, to that effect uh, no different than the jet stream up above which is you know a hundred you know j really just a giant air conditioning system that pumps out air you know in in a circular pattern running at I don't know between one hundred and two hundred miles an hour in really one big circular motion. And if you take the conveyor system and put that on a flat map, it also goes circular. It's, uh, again, the design is fantastic. Uh, and, and it's something that we can, you know, only now can get our heads around because we can do similar, similar things, not just um, uh, in real life, but in the, uh, uh, in the Hollywood world. You know, we, we try to simulate this stuff all the time, although most of the time now it's done in CGI. But before that, you know, we had to invent ways of creating 
you know, big scale stuff, you know, in a in a small environment. And uh, I think only now can we even really explain it to ourselves how, you know, it makes more sense to us now. Mm. You know, as far as the uh, uh, the whole weather, the currents and all that thing, I kind of like the the just the heat model. I mean, yeah. that that is uh, I don't remember if you put that out or no, I know who you're talking about. That's that's um, Matt Boylan. The, yeah, uh, the Matt, just, the I, I mean, you add heat to water and you start moving things. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, if you hadn't listened to his thing, uh, you know, his his one great gem of an interview where when when the NASA guys explained it to him, when they dropped that bomb on his head. Uh, it, I can't even imagine being explained if I was twenty-something years old. That oh, by the way, you know, you, I know you're not into conspiracies, but the world's flat. Right. That that I, it's just amazing. I'm surprised he didn't drink himself into a coma. <laughs> the the um, was that they explained to him that the entire system was based off of temperature, and that everything really happened down below. It wasn't the sun generating a lot of heat. I mean, the sun generates heat, you know, no different than a, a big light bulb, but. Everything else, all the mechanisms, mechanisms below were based off of temperature, and that made perfect sense between the geologic systems, the underwater conveyor system, and the uh, the jet stream up above. You could do uh, it's almost unlimited the the amount of combinations you can use. Uh, it's redundant systems that play off each other, and oh, uh, just wonder, wonder, wonderful stuff. At least until we start messing with it. Right, right, yeah. yeah. Let's let's. Uh, yeah, another extra topic. cloud up there for us. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, Mark, I think we got a, a uh, at least enough out there for our audience to wet their whistle. Cool. And to uh, you know, at least uh, I I think that uh, anybody who takes a serious look at this with uh, their mind open enough, like I said earlier, that their brains don't fall out, <laughs> but it's open enough that they uh, you know they they uh, suspend their disbelief. Long enough to take a serious look at all the evidence that is out there, it will definitely raise some serious questions. And and I, you know, this this whole idea of a flat Earth has uh, it's puts quite a few different puzzle pieces together for me. You know, it's like yeah. okay, well now this thing over here that I really couldn't understand, it kind of makes sense within this model. Yeah, uh, yeah, fine. You know, like I, like I was saying, the Nibiru stuff. Yeah. Okay. You know those all those reflections or whatever they are, these photographs that people are taking, that kind of makes sense if I if I consider it within a uh, within an enclosed uh, environment. Yeah. Find find me, and I'm not kidding when I say this. You know, find me, anyone listening, a conspiracy that doesn't work better in an enclosed system mm. that does a globe. It, it, everything you will look at, it, you know, if you look close enough, it just fits better. Uh, and and I I have yet I have yet to be proven wrong. Yeah. So yeah. definitely got to agree there. Well, Mark, I have a I have a, a distinct feeling that we will be talking again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is some good stuff. And man, thank you so much for putting that putting uh, the clues together. You did a fantastic job with those. Well, thank you, thank you very much, and and thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Cool. And and as always, every time I, I delve into any of this type of material, my brain's going to be going for days again now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I love it. I absolutely love it. This is good stuff. Cool. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody out there for listening. You guys, well, before I um, cut this off, you guys got anything else you want to uh, throw out there before you go? No, my mind's on the floor right now. I just, <laughs> just listen, thank you for all the all the information you're putting out, and uh, yeah, like 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 Tom said, you know, a lot of puzzle pieces get put together with this, but also a lot of puzzle pieces get taken apart. Yeah, indeed. Uh, but, but you know, I, I like I try to tell people, it's like you know, don't don't let your brain melt, and one day at a time, and uh, you know, with any luck, uh, this thing will hit some sort of critical mass, and you know, maybe we'll get to we'll get to see it for ourselves. Yeah, I would, yeah, I. I I gotta figure out a way to see it. <laughs> Some way. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you, man. Well, thank you. Hey, no, no, thank you guys. All right. Namaste, my friends, and we will see you guys in the next show. Condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. Ta da! Cool. Are we out? Right. Yeah, that's a. Oh.